The following radio program is for informational purposes only and is neither specific nor tailored financial advice to any individual. It is not intended as an offer or solicitation for the purchase or sale of any financial instrument. Always do your own due diligence and consult a financial advisor before making any investments. Investing involves risk, which can result in the loss of any or all principal. Peter Weitz is a registered investment advisor with Fusion Analytics Investment Partners, LLC, an SEC-registered investment advisor as well as a registered rep with Fusion Analytics Securities, LLC, a FINRA registered broker-dealer and SIPC member. All views expressed in this program are those of the host or guests and do not reflect the opinions of Fusion Analytics Investment Partners nor its affiliates. Your investments. How secure are you that they are secure? Do you want to know more about investing, retirement, and moving to the next level in business? Welcome to In Black and Whites, featuring host Peter Whites. Our program will answer all of the questions about your future and so much more. It's all about smart business and smarter investing. Now, here is your host, Peter Whites. Hey, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the In Black and Whites radio show. I'm your host, Peter Whites. We got a really great show for you today. Uh, and I hope you're excited to hear. I have Chip Starnes, the American businessman held hostage in his Beijing factory last June. He's going to be joining us in the studio for the entire hour. Uh, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about doing business in China, sort of what happened to Chip. And now he's made a shift into doing business in India in lieu of China. But I encourage all of you uh, to listen intently. Call in. Uh, today's uh, listener line is one 866 472 Five seven nine zero. Chip will be happy to take all of your calls, uh, or you can email the show, and we'll read the emails online. Uh, and the email address is Peter at inblackandwhites dot com. Uh, in black and whites, whites is spelled W E I T Z. Also, an interesting thing is today during the show, we're going to be posting pictures on my blog, the In Black and Whites blog, www.inblackandwhites.com, dot uh, com, that Chip actually took when he was held hostage inside of the factory. And he's going to kind of tell us as we post the pictures what's been going on. Those pictures will also be available on Twitter at Peter Whites is my Twitter handle or at LinkedIn. My address is Peter Whites. So with that, let me tell you a little bit about Chip and then we'll get right into the program. Uh, in 2001, he co-founded a company called Specialty Medical Supplies. And uh, it was a company that was specializing in mail order diabetes, uh, respiratory uh, and uh, safety seal lancets. Uh, they ended up patenting a couple of products, and they started manufacturing uh, over in China. His prior experience uh, was that he joined a publicly traded healthcare company in Jacksonville called Transworld Healthcare that specialized in mail-order diabetes, and he ran the company's sales and marketing division, which allowed him to understand how this industry works and ultimately lead him into going into manufacturing himself. Uh, in 2003... They built Beijing Private uh, – Specialty Medical Supplies Beijing Private Limited, and he spent the next several years building it into one of the largest diabetes-related manufacturing facilities in the world. He had over 100,000 square feet of manufacturing space and more than 500 employees that produced multiple product lines of plastic-related devices and sterile wet products such as alcohol prep pads. After more than a decade in China, he made international headlines last June uh, when the factory aggressively turned on him and took him hostage. He was held in confinement in his manufacturing facility in Beijing for seven days on rumors that the entire factory was relocating to India and employees were going to be left without severances. Even though this rumor was false, Chip was forced to pay a significant ransom in order to guarantee his safety and freedom. The Chinese police, the local Chinese government, and the U.S. Embassy offered little to no help throughout the ordeal. This event made national headlines, and he appeared on numerous programs such as Today Show, CNN, CNBC, and Bloomberg. Uh, but most importantly, he's a guest on my show, the In Black and Whites radio show. And with that, I'd like to welcome Chip Starnes to the program. Good morning, Chip. Hey, good morning, Peter. How are you? I'm great. Thank you for coming, and I appreciate you being on the program. I'd like to start out by uh, you giving us just a brief history of you being an American businessman uh, residing in Florida and – having to maneuver and figure out a way to actually manufacture in China. And what led you to get to manufacturing in China? Yeah, you know, I, I guess so. that's, that's a great question. Um, you know, when, ever since I was very young, I thought I would do something internationally. I, have a, I actually have a tennis background and, you know, luckily was able to travel internationally and play a lot of uh, tennis and uh, at a very young age. And, 
And then as I grew up and finished college, I got involved into the, the health care side of things. And, and then on the service side first, I think you had mentioned that, uh, Transworld Healthcare. And then ultimately I transferred from Jacksonville, Florida, down to South Florida and got involved with a company called uh, HDI Home Diagnostics, which is, um, is actually a manufacturer of blood test strips. It's the little, little strip, the reagents that you put blood on and measures the glucose level in there. Um, that was my first taste of manufacturing. And, you know, through there, I was, I was with that company for about a year, year and a half, and uh, we were actually trying to build the company up and, and, and sell it off at a particular time when I joined. Um, and there were, some little, there were some little blood devices called Lancets, and there was a company down, you know, being in South Florida is really an international hub for many, many multiple countries and cultures, et cetera, as you know. Um, there was a particular device that's used every single time you test your blood. It's called a blood lancet. And, you know, I couldn't understand this particular company at the time, 15 years ago when I was there. They, they manufactured all of the test strips that you put the blood on to read the uh, glucose, but they didn't pay or really care too much about the plastic devices being the lancet and the lancing device that goes hand in hand that you have to use every time when you test your blood. Um, so that company that I was with was actually importing or buying from an importer. Um, in South Florida. Um, and shortly after that, the company, you know, got spun off. It got sold, and um, I went on my merry way, and we started. I had a partner who um, I actually had worked with previously in Jacksonville at Transworld. Um, his name's Les Capella, and we founded um, Special Medical Supplies at the very end of about 99 to 2000. And also, that was when I actually patented my first product. I focused on that little blood lancet, the little device that pricks your finger to get the blood, to put on that, that reagent, that test strip to test the glucose. Um, we actually, when I took that patent, um, we kind of figured out, well, what can we do with that? So you know, we had some connections from previous relations, and uh, I had a gentleman actually up north who knew, had some relations where over in China, where we can actually take that design, our new patented product, and outsource that and actually get it made for us. And that's kind of what we did. We took that, uh, we took that Lancet and uh, that one product. We paid for the tools, and we paid, paid to get the product uh, made, manufactured, and, and then packaged, and we brought it in. And we started with that one particular product and uh, started selling it in what we call the Medicare uh, mail-order diabetes market. There's a company out there called today Liberty Medical Supply, which is the largest supplier, or used to be at the time, um, was one of our largest customers in that market. And that's how, that's kind of how we got started. And that was our first touch in, not 100% into China, but the first step into basically outsource or subcontract manufacturing. So what happens? So now you're subcontracting. And, you know, we read a lot in the paper about how China is the, you know, the lowest cost to manufacture and everybody makes stuff from China because it's so cheap. So what drove you ultimately to go over and attempt and then become a manufacturer in China? Yeah, you know, I, I think the first step, that the, you know, at the time, you know, we're going back um, probably 12, 13 years now. It was a really good decision for us to the first step was to, to, to outsource. Um, didn't understand the manufacturing too much. So we, you know, we outsourced that particular product. We developed the market. But like anything, everything, everything changes. Everything becomes more competitive. Doesn't, I think that doesn't really matter what industry that you're in. That's always the case. And everybody's always pushing to find more efficiencies, more, more streamlining of how to do something better. And that's exactly what took place with us um, on the particular land set. Um, we were bringing the product in. And we, you know, at a, at a you know, manufacturer's or, you know, we're buying it. He's mark, got his mark up. We've got ours. We're reselling it to wholesalers. Wholesalers are reselling it to the next level. And it became, you know, apparent very quick that in order for us to be able to sustain life, that we're going to have to figure out how to, to bring in more efficiencies. And, you know, in that particular case, that was making the next step of stepping out into China and figuring out how to, what I call, you know, kind of close the whole entire loop of, you know, from the R&D side to controlling the manufacturing of the product to the packaging, the assembly, the sterilization, bringing it in, and then on our company here in the U.S., developing and controlling uh, the marketing and distributions of the product, so controlling the whole entire life cycle. So after a couple years of outsourcing, um, we, we decided to make that step in in, in the Beijing. So let, let me ask the real tough question. So you went over to China on your own. 
we had a, you know, a briefcase full of, of money to go into business. And, and what'd you know? Yeah, that briefcase, I think, comes back later to haunt me. <laughs> yeah, like yeah, well, case. we're going to get into that in a little bit. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I, you're, you're right about that. Um, luckily, like I said, I had the, um, you know, my parents supported me very young age to go and travel and tennis and stuff like that. And I think that, you know, has allowed me to get where I am today. And at 29 years old, um, my partner and I, we knew we had to do something. I had the most experience, I guess, going overseas and traveling internationally and in a you know, uh, probably the type A, more aggressive one. So I said, let's go over there and try to figure it out. And, uh, you know, multiple sources and uh, relationships that we had had told us that, you know, I, I don't think you can go over there and you can you can own a company in China 100%. You know, everything's either joint ventured or, you know, controlled or, you know, closed off. But, uh, you know, after doing some due diligence, I think we went in about the end of 2002, we started looking. Um, we were lucky enough to find a particular uh, lady over there to help us get going. She was actually a tour guide, believe it or not, and came very close with us because she was English speaking, which was very important, uh, uh, for obvious reasons. But, um, yeah, we went in there and, uh, we, we, um, uh, you know, found our way. And uh, at 29 years, we found out that it was true that we could go in there and actually set up what's called a Wolfie. Um, that stands for W-O-F-E, a wholly owned foreign entity. And if you, you, I mentioned earlier about our first patented product it's called a Safety Seal Lancet. And so they had special economic zones in all different areas. I mean, we looked at Longfang, we looked in Tianjin, we looked in Beijing, we looked in South China, um, also Shanghai. Um, at this particular time, it was uh, the big thing was power. Um, you know, there was a lot of uh, um, economic development zones that were being set up that you that were welcoming foreign capital to come in. But one of the things about that was there wasn't a lot of stable areas. Uh, around at the time for power, for example. So one of the things that we, uh, that, you know, Shanghai was one, but one of the areas was about three hours, was three hours out Shanghai, outside Shanghai. But believe it or not, it was still running three days without power. So massive generator support was needed there. So ultimately, it was a little higher in terms of just fixed expenses and costs. But Beijing was our ultimate uh, pick uh, for us because it allowed us the most stable foundation for us to build um, it also uh, gave us access to a lot of professional people close by to the Beijing district, you know, through bus or train could easily get to where our facility was. So we actually found that it was true. We set our Wolfie up uh, on the on the first trip with that briefcase of cash, as you as you, uh, <laughs> as you mentioned, and um, did our I did my first contract with the local government there. Now keep in mind that we did everything completely backwards, nothing the proper way it should have been done. But uh, we did a contract. We did a lease for our first facility for 35,000 square feet. And um, I came back seven weeks later um, with, a, with an ink contract and a facility that uh, began to started to be built out. That's amazing. We, uh, we're getting real close to taking our first break, Chip. So what I want to do is uh, let our viewers know that coming up after the break, we're going to talk about two things. We're going to talk about what it was like doing business in China sort of 10 years ago and ultimately what it was like doing business in China today or at least within the last year and what's changed in China along the way. And then I think obviously we're going to get deep into what happened when you ultimately left China and you were held hostage. So with that in mind, we're going to take a quick break and you're listening to the In Black and Whites radio program. I'm your host, Peter Weitz. When it comes to business, you'll find the experts here. Voice America Business Network. Climbing Mount Everest is an amazing feat, and many have died trying to do so. However, more people have died descending Mount Everest than in reaching the summit. Part of the problem may be that people are so focused on reaching their objective that they fail to plan appropriately for what they will do or should be prepared for afterward. Similarly, people are so focused on saving for retirement and reaching retirement that they fail to plan appropriately for what they will encounter once they have actually retired. With one out of every four 65-year-olds today living past the age of 90, you may be retired longer than you are actually working. 
working? Have you devised a plan, process, and discipline to ensure that you will not run out of money? If you are not sure what to do, then simply contact Peter Weitz and his retirement team at Fusion Analytics. We help manage human emotions using three proprietary investment techniques. Our job is to evaluate the forces that the typical investor can't see so that wealth is preserved and not lost. Find out more at inblackandwhites.com. Whites is spelled W-E-I-T-Z. Email Peter at inblackandwhites.com. In Black and Whites, we win by not losing. Stephen Douglas Associates, delivering talent, impacting results. Now celebrating 30 years of bringing top talent to some of the nation's most recognizable companies and private equity firms, whether they need highly qualified executives permanently or on a project basis. Recognized by Inc. Magazine as one of the fastest growing companies in America in 2012 and 2013. To learn more, visit us at www.stephendouglas.com. When it comes to business, you'll find the experts here. Voice America Business Network. You are listening to In Black and Whites. To reach Peter Whites or his guest today, please call 1-866-472-5790. That's 1-866-472-5790. You may also send an email to peter at inblackandwhites.com. Whites is spelled W-E-I-T-Z. Email peter at inblackandwhites.com. Now, back to this week's program. Thank you very much and welcome back. Uh, We are with Chip Starnes the American businessman held hostage over in China last June. Um, Before the break, we were talking about the reasons that you go into China for manufacturing. And we're going to dig a little bit deeper into that in this segment. And we're also going to talk about the paradigm shift that took place in China and why it's not today what it was uh, 10 years ago. So with that, Chip, you build this factory in China. You come back to the States. You've got a contract in place. You've got the electricity and power that you need. You go back to China, you start manufacturing. What's going on 10 years ago? Yeah, so, t- so 10 years ago, I mean, I, I think, um, and I can't, uh, you know, regardless of what, what took place and happened to me um, not too long ago, uh, you know, the first 10 years in China w- w- was great. I mean, uh, China was exploding access to, uh, you know, actually capital there, the banks, access to labor there. Um, the willingness for all the local governments and the, and, the, and the vast amount of land to help you with infrastructure and build out was there. I mean, they were really, really looking for foreign investment to come in to create jobs. And I think our, our timing with that was just uh, was spot on. I mean, I, I remember when we first went in, we, you know, we had our first 35,000 square feet. Over the next four years of building, we took that to 100,000 square feet. But I remember putting new lines on for assembly and packaging type of uh, people, and we would go and we'd open up, let's say, t- you know, a job for 25 new, new, new employees to come in. And I remember one particular morning uh, coming in, and we literally had 500 people there waiting um, to sign up uh, for the job. So, and also at that time, which which I'm, I'm sure that a lot of the listeners and yourself are familiar with. You know, there's always, there was a lot of talk about how upset the business was, and especially from the exchange rate side, of the currency side, whereas China was always undervaluing um, the renminbi, um, or the Chinese yuan. You know, it was pegged forever at 8.26 to 1. Um, obviously, at the time we went in and started building out the facility, being able to get that 8.26 Two six to one ratio really gave us a lot of buying power, especially when it came to buying a, all the capital and equipment and setting up uh, uh, over there uh, in China. So you know, the first ten, first six, seven, eight years or six, seven years were, were really, really, really prosperous there. And so, uh, and we talk about that. And so, I guess the first sort of paradigm shift is this whole for, uh, foreign currency exchange issue. So, the renminbi was pegged at eight point two six to one. Today, it's roughly what six and change. Yeah, I think it's uh, from last time. I believe, yeah, I think it's between six and six point one. I mean, that's that's significant. So, about eight, uh, probably about I'd say about four or five years ago, obviously um, the Chinese government started to crack a little bit. So they said, okay, you know what? And, it become part of the real world of um, uh, 
the, 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 the trade of the world and everything, we've got to start letting our currency float instead of what a lot of people termed as manipulating it and pegging it. And so they started to float that. So that 8.26 started to go to 8.1, and then it broke under 1 and, you know, all that. Then what happened was um, – uh, that doesn't sound like a lot, but over the last four years, if you take a hundred hundred thousand dollars, for example, if you're sending a hundred thousand dollars in every month to to China, whereas that hundred thousand six seven years ago was a hundred thousand, today it's twenty eight percent less. So that hundred thousand is only going to get you roughly sixty seven or sixty eight thousand, or if you will, or, or something like that, seventy two thousand dollars of buying power. So it's a significant and, change that, that that took place on the currency exchange. And so all of a sudden now we're seeing this cost of labor that everybody goes to China for is beginning to get more expensive. Yeah, and you know the other thing was during that same decade period that we were there. I mean, you know, we started out with with young with young workers and they're 20 years old. Now all of a sudden, 10 years later, they're 30. Now they have children. And you know, there's been then you've had the more a ton of investment, obviously, as we all know, have, has gone into China. You know, building and making everything there. The economy in China has been growing at double digits forever. So there's been more and more money that's come into the economy over there. Well, these same workers that came in at 20 years old at our facility are now 30. They all have their own children. The last thing they want for them to do now, there's more of a focus on education, and they don't want to pass it down for them going into the same same type of situation that they're in working into a factory. And so now all of a sudden you've got, because of that, it's going on more money. You have social benefits that are going up. Okay, which is all normal type of stuff. You have retirement, you have housing funds and fees that are going up. Okay, you have you have actually believe it or not, right before I left there, we we had uh, we were paying um, monthly union dues. Okay, and and believe it or not, we weren't even unionized. So you know the government was really starting to put all these things in and really starting to what we you know use the word tax, very taxing events and all these types of things for all these. Multiple thousands and thousands, hundred thousands of uh, international businesses that are in China. So it, all of a sudden, this paradigm over, over the last ten years, everything you're starting to get squeezed from many, many different angles, and it's starting to make uh, China not what China used to be. So now here it is, uh, 2012. You've been manufacturing in China for you know over uh, over a decade, and. You know, there's now a big fee compression on your side to manufacture your product for less, uh, you know, tied into health care and Medicare, Medicaid reimbursement. And you've got to make a decision. And so the decision is, where can we manufacture at a lower cost? Yeah. So, you know, I mean, with, with all that said, obviously we're in the vice. And, you know, I'm sure I'm, I'm not the only industry or the particular commodity type of item. This is uh, goes through multiple industries. Um we're, we're, we're in a squeeze now, and it's not only the squeeze, you know. Uh, we, so, so like I mentioned earlier about how, how you got to figure out how to do things more efficient, you know, there's one thing, as we all know, that's always consistent in life, and that's change. So even though China was great 10 or 12 years ago, things change. And so that's what happened with the business. Um, where at the one point I mentioned I'll walk in for 25 positions and there's 500 employees there to pick from and pick the best candidates and do the proper screening, et cetera. At this point in time, you know, the, the most laborious part of our business was our plastics division. And we couldn't even staff the plastic division anymore. And, you know, we're making uh, pieces of a Bloodland set that we're making 1.45 billion pieces per year, um, over 100 million pieces per month. And we can't adequately staff it. Not only can't we adequately staff it, we can't even get people to come and apply for jobs anymore. And if we and then also what happened was if we did hire ten or twelve people, we were finding that within three or four, five, six weeks, only two or the two or three of the twelve would actually stick and and stay on with the company. So not only were we being squeezed in all these other financial type of ways, you know, through social benefits, insurance, exchange rates, we didn't even have much less the ability from a labor standpoint to sustain the business, much less give it the opportunity to grow. That's interesting. So now, so you got two problems going on. You got no workforce and you've got a currency that's dropped 30% relative to the U.S. dollar. So you're getting hit from both sides. Absolutely. Squeeze from both sides. So, you know, one thing to note is we've got two divisions. So the two divisions, we've got the big plastic divisions. And, you know, we make about multiple products line on the practice side. 
So the, we have all, another division, what we call our wet division, where we manufacture sterile alcohol prep pads, iodines, and other various types of uh, you know, disinfectant type of, um, of sterile wipes. Um, that's more of an automated type of situation where you can you pretty much uh, take one machine to one person, uh, pair it up. Um, on the plastic side, it was more like four, five, six to one. And so that was, that, was the, that was the downside on the plastic side. So we were forced to the decision, like, we've got, we've got to make a change. Obviously, even, even just the sheer fact, and forget about all the financial side, we don't have labor to, to support or sustain the business. So what we made the decision to do in basically, let me see, in 2013, um, was we made the decision to go at, excuse me, in 2012. In 2012, we made the decision we're going to have to make a shift. Um, we're going to have to relocate, set up a new facility with the primary focus be on the plastic division first. And we spent a lot of time, you know, we looked at Mexico, we looked at Laos. You know, a lot of people, you hear a lot of talk about Vietnam. We looked at Vietnam. And ultimately, we ended up in India. And um, and I'll just I'll, I'll I'll make one note on that here real quick. Is a lot of people say, oh, Vietnam is, is the great. Why didn't you go to Vietnam? Really, really cheap letter. You know, Vietnam, Vietnam. We did look at Vietnam, but Vietnam. The downside of Vietnam is two things, in my in my personal opinion. One is it's got a population of about 90 to 100 million. Okay. In the grand scheme of things, you're looking at India and you look at China. It's it, it's extremely small. And number two is Vietnam is 100% dependent upon import of all raw materials. And so that was the other thing. So, you know, there is a lot of input. There's a lot of money and foreign capital going into Vietnam right now, but it's only a time till that gets squeezed, and then you're still dependent upon importing of raw materials. And we ultimately picked India uh, to make that, uh, make that move because of, one, India today is about 15 or 20 years behind where China sits right now. So access to labor is there. Two, uh, unbelievable, they have oil, petroleums, and access to, to, to raw materials and uh, spunlet non-wovens and other various materials that we use in ours. It's, it's all available in India. And so from a labor and raw material aspects. And then on top of that, you know, obviously 15, 20 years behind China is you've got the labor um, and the lower labor rates is there as well. That's awesome. And so we make a move into China and uh... – we're going to tease everybody. You go over back to uh, – because we're about to take another break. But before we do, you go back to China to notify the workers and the plastics division that they are going to be laid off. And you go to give them severance, and you think that's going well. And ultimately, the the, the uh, wet side, the prep pad side says, well, we want to be laid off too. And you said, no, we're not firing you. We're not laying you off, and ultimately they hold you hostage. And with that, I think this is a great place to take a break. We're going to come back, and we're going to spend the last segment, Chip, talking about what it was like to be a businessman held hostage in China and the things that you were thinking about in that week in captivity. I've posted some pictures on the blog uh, that show you that show your office where you were held in captivity for that entire week. You can go to that at inblackandwhites.com. Chip will be happy to answer any of your questions when we come back. And with that, we're going to take a short break. You're listening to the In Black and Whites radio program on the Voice America Business Network. From the boardroom to you, Voice America Business Network. Stephen Douglas Associates, delivering talent, impacting results. Now celebrating 30 years of bringing top talent to some of the nation's most recognizable companies and private equity firms, whether they need highly qualified executives permanently or on a project basis. Recognized by Inc. Magazine as one of the fastest growing companies in America in 2012 and 2013. To learn more, visit us at www.stephendouglas.com. Climbing Mount Everest is an amazing feat, and many have died trying to do so. However, more people have died descending Mount Everest than in reaching the summit. Part of the problem may be that people are so focused on reaching their objective that they fail to plan appropriately for what they will do or should be prepared for afterward. 
Similarly, people are so focused on saving for retirement and reaching retirement that they fail to plan appropriately for what they will encounter once they have actually retired. With one out of every four 65-year-olds today living past the age of 90, you may be retired longer than you are actually working. Have you devised a plan, process, and discipline to ensure that you will not run out of money? If you are not sure what to do, then simply contact Peter Weitz and his retirement team at Fusion Analytics. We help manage human emotions using three proprietary investment techniques. Our job is to evaluate the forces that the typical investor can't see so that wealth is preserved and not lost. Find out more at inblackandwhites.com. Weitz is spelled W-E-I-T-Z. Email Peter at inblackandwhites.com. In Black and Whites, we win by not losing. You are listening to In Black and Whites. To reach Peter Whites or his guest today, please call 1-866-472-5790. That's 1-866-472-5790. You may also send an email to peter at inblackandwhites.com. Whites is spelled W-E-I-T-Z. Email Peter at inblackandwhites.com. Now, back to this week's program. Thank you very much, and welcome back to the show. I'm Peter Whites, the host of the In Black and Whites radio program. We're joined today in the studio by Chip Starnes, the American businessman held hostage in China. And before the break, uh, Chip made a comment. He was making an interesting point about the shift that's really gone on in, in China and how it reflects other communities. And at the break, Chip and I were talking uh, briefly, and I just wanted to reiterate this point. One of the reasons and one of the big sort of, if you, if you look in the business community in my, my world in finance um, and in, in money management is that everybody's focused on Vietnam. And Chip's point was, and it was an interesting one, you can't find a workforce with 1.3 billion people in China. You're certainly not going to find a workforce in Vietnam with 90 to 100 million people. And I think that's an interesting point to make, and I just wanted to make sure I reiterated that to the listeners. That being said, let's get into the real meat of the story. So, Chip, you decide to leave China. You go to India. You're getting ready to move all your equipment on the plastic side to India. You fly over to your factory, and what happens? Yeah, so uh, like I said, in 2012, we had made the uh, finally made the decision that something's going to have to give, and we had made the, we made the decision that we needed – to go ahead and move the most labor-intense part of the business, which is the plastic division, over to uh, to India uh, and Mumbai. And so, uh, with that being said, what we did was is, is in 2013. Um, you know, I think this is another point because it, this wasn't uh, shared a lot, or, or it wasn't really made known out there that it, it, this was not a secret uh, to our management or even to our employees that were on the plastics division side. That we were that we were moving um, to India. You know, we we had announced that uh, six and eight weeks be- beforehand, so twelve weeks that we uh, ultimately. I mean, the plastic division was only running at about thirty percent as it was. So it was it, it, ultimately it was already shut down. Um, so I, when I was going over there, you know, we have an HR department that was going to go ahead and take care of the paperwork wise of giving the people their proper severances for the last thirty or thirty five people that were there to let them go. I mean, I was really going over there to just make sure that the, all of our molds and tools and all of our equipment, you know, got properly packaged up and everything stayed on schedule to get it, you know, uh, wrapped up in the containers and shipped out. And shipped out. Um, so that's, you know, that, that was the point of me going over there and doing that. Um, I, arrived, I arrived on, I believe, it was a Monday, and I went into the office the first day on Tuesday, and our packaging and loading was – was scheduled to begin. I believe it was going to be three days. It was like like a Friday, Saturday, Sunday type of uh, arrangement. We're going to do about five containers a day of a bunch of molds and uh, injection equipment, tools, etc. Um, so we went in and we started that process. Uh, we that same Tuesday, the first day I went into the office, we went ahead and we did the paperwork. And the last 30 to 35 workers in the plastic division um, were let go. Um, this is what was what was kind of interesting. What sparked this? Now, now, you know. Now I'll fast forward from Tuesday afternoon to about Thursday because I didn't know all of this internal rumbling was kind of going on. A lot of our workers. The good news about it was have been with us for a very long time. Um, 
there's two divisions, like I mentioned. There's the plastic side and there's the wet side. The wet side of our business was aggressively growing. So we were, we, we were actively adding equipment. As of June, when all this took place, we're adding equipment and hiring people. We weren't actually hiring people, but what we were doing, Peter, was actually shifting as much of the labor and this, you know, this this great workforce that we had had in the plastic division had been so dedicated to our company for so long. We were shifting them as many as we could over into the wet side of the division. Obviously, if you have the, you know, people that have that experience and that trained, um, you want to try to keep those people with the organization. That's ultimately what we were trying to do. But unfortunately, we had kind of maxed out over there on the wet side, so I didn't have any more positions to put these other 30 people. So these people were given severances, and most of them have been there with the company for seven to nine years. And once calculated, and the lump sum payments that we were need to make to be made to them for and, and no severance packages ship they're dictated by China law yeah absolutely absolutely one hundred percent according to Chinese law we followed it down to the T and they got nice checks especially for China you know and these are local surrounding you know village people that have been with us for a very long time they got very very nice checks now um uh, you know uh, you know. Not known to me at the time, you know, this is Tuesday, you know, this is a festering Wednesday, then getting to Thursday, I come in Thursday, all of a sudden, we're supposed to be packed, finishing the final packaging of a lot of our equipment, breaking down some machinery. All of a sudden, in the wet division, we had 60, uh, 60 people working over there. And they do, we do three shifts, 20 on, 40 off, and they, they rotate around. So there was 40 that were not working. I came in Thursday morning, they're all... All the workers are sitting all over the equipment, and there. And I asked, you know, my my general manager. I said, "Well, what's going on? Why aren't we, you know, unloading and packaging and properly preparing and creating all all this equipment?" And they said, "Well, they're upset because those other girls got severance packages and they want to quit their jobs, and they want the same payouts as them." And I'm like, you know, us as Americans or anybody thinks, well, that you know, that, that makes no sense at all. You know, who wants a severance? Don't you want a job, right? And they and they said that wasn't – and a lot of the workers over on the wet side said that was not fair, that they wanted the lump sum payouts because they were just shifted over only three, four, or five months ago from the plastic divisions where they have worked seven or eight or nine years and put over here, and it's not fair. They want the same payout as they got. And so they said they refused to work, and they're not going to let us load the equipment until they got their pay. And that's when the first standoff happened uh, uh, with between us, management, if you will, and the workers, trying how do you negotiate with somebody that, that, at, that in essence, wants to quit but wants full payout for quitting. And well, so and you've got – ma- and in management, you know, it, it's essentially you as an American owner of a company in China. And whom? Is it Chinese management? Yeah. So I really had um, – uh, three people there. One was my, my general manager, and, uh, and then I had a vice general manager, and then my controller uh, was there. And so those were, those were my, uh, my three, um, my three uh, people. And, as and, they, how do they, and how do they decide who to, whose interests are being best served? Well, I mean, I, I'm sorry, what do you mean, how do they decide who's... Meaning like, I mean, you know, they're, they're ultimately Chinese. Are they going to represent the Chinese yeah, people? Yeah, very, gonna... very good question. So that's exactly what happened. So when this, when this stands off, I'll just fast forward a little bit because it plays right into the, uh, the, what happens next. So I get to Friday afternoon and no equipment's been, no equipment's been packaged, okay? And I'll answer this question very clearly in, in about 30 seconds. Um, Four o'clock Friday afternoon, there's been no progress on... Uh, canceled containers supposed to come in Friday. We're pushing to Saturday, hoping things going to uh, give up. So Thursday, you know, this is another piece. We have brought in what's called a chartered engineer from India. Came in Thursday. Okay, this is the other thing that took place. Chartered en- engineer comes in. He comes to value all the used equipment, the molding, and stuff to put a value on it, so the product can be properly imported and cleared through customs in India. All right. When that gentleman came in, he also valued went in and valued all the equipment in the company, including the, 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 wet, uh, the wet machinery. When he went in and started valuing the wet machinery, a rumor also on top of them wanting severance packages, a rumor started to spread that not only was the plastic division going to move, but the whole entire facility was going to move. Because, that, because the reason why that's proof is because this gentleman that came in was valuing the equipment for the alcohol prep pad machine. Now, what everybody didn't know, and they still don't know today or 
care to know is the fact we value that equipment because this is a licensed gentleman that we can actually take that equipment and actually borrow money on it, okay? So we can use that document as a, it's basically like a survey of the equipment for the value. So that rumor started to spread late Thursday, Friday. Friday afternoon, about 4 o'clock, I was going to leave. I grabbed my bag, and there were some, there were some people that came into the executive wing of the office, and they were injured people, and we had some injured. There's a process. You know, we have about 300 employees, and some employees, obviously, in, in big factories uh, get, get hurt. And we had a couple of people come in, and they were still waiting payment and settlement. We pay a portion. The government pays a portion. The insurance pays a portion. And so we were about to pay that. And I told them, yeah, it's fine. You know, you're going to get your payment next week on that. And they said, no. They said, uh, we understand that uh, you're moving the whole entire facility this weekend, and we're not going, you're not allowed to leave until we get our money right now. And I was like, it's 4 o'clock Friday. It wasn't a lot of money, but we didn't, we, it was after 4 o'clock, banks are closed. We didn't have act, they didn't want to check. They want to cash. And so, I, you know, if somebody gives you an ultimate threat like that, you can't leave. You first, uh, anyone's reaction is kind of brush it off, which I did. I didn't pay much attention to it. My general manager had translated that for me. I kind of went back to my office a little bit. And then about 15 minutes later came out. They were sitting in the conference room. I'm like, you know, I was like, why, why are these people still here? Why, a, why are they in the executive wing? And this is going back to the culture thing, right? They, they, the people, you know, the sayings in China, the people rule China. So now you've got the, or my management in there, and now you've got four, five, six people that are in there that are not going to get on the bad side of, of them because afraid of the repercussions that might, something might happen to them if they did. So then they came up. I was going to leave. And they said, we told you you're not leaving until – we get our money. So now the second time I'm starting, now I'm saying, okay, this is this is kind of this is very strange, you know. Are they? And I'm thinking, what are they going to do? How are they going to keep me four or five guys and keep me restrained and keep me here? So I went back there. Again, I walked back to my office for ten or fifteen minutes, grabbed my bag, and said, okay, that's it. The third time I walked out, it's about about four thirty at this time. The gates open in the front of our facility, and it's kind of uh, barricaded off. We have a big still uh, fence that goes all around the facility, and um, with the guard gate, security, and everything, the, the security gate opens in the front. Five, tru- five trucks come in with about 25 or 30 people loaded in the back of each truck. It's almost like a, it's almost like a military uh, invasion, if you will. I can kind of, kind of paint the picture a little bit. They're all jumping out of the truck. And the whole entire office is ransacked about three minutes after that. They come in. And next thing you know, in the executive wing, there's about 150 to 200 people that are standing in the office. Every single one of them, every single, every single employee, and then every single employee was almost standing in the executive wing, 200-plus people, by 4.45 in the afternoon on Friday, demanding full severance, payouts, and everything else. And so now... You know, and we're almost close to taking a break and uh, for this segment. But what's going through your mind? Well, right, right, right now I'm start, uh, now I'm, I'm thinking. Uh, I know that my 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 management team is not on my side. I asked them to tell them to leave. They said they can't do that. They can't. It became very clear. They specifically told me they can't make it look like I'm, that they're supporting me, and or help, trying to help me because they're afraid of the repercussions of all the villagers and everything around the area might come after them later. So now I'm standing there at this particular point in my time going, I have nowhere to turn to or or try to figure out how to get out of the situation. That's what's going to my mind at that time. And you've got your cell phone, correct, that does allow you to call back to the United States. Yeah. So, I'm, so I immediately make a phone call back to the U.S. And I, I actually I didn't even do that at that time. I'm thinking, okay, call the local police. I told my GM. They said, can't do that. They didn't want to be associated with me at all. So I'm like, my only thing to do, I went on my, my phone. My computer was still working at the time. They did end up cutting the Internet line. I went on there, and I got the U.S. Embassy number, and I called the U.S. Embassy. And I said, I need some help. I said, I, I don't have the way, you know, I don't speak uh, Mandarin. I said, I need somebody to try to call the local police. And so the, the embassy tried to do what they did as much as they could do with just alerting the local police force, which, as it turned out later that evening, uh, would meant meant zero. It meant very little what they were able to do. And with that, Chip, we're going to take our uh, last break of the show. And when we come back, we're going to hear about the week that you spent in captivity. I've posted the pictures from inside your office uh, that you were able to take with your with your smartphone 
so that people can actually see your living conditions and where you le- lived for one week while they held you hostage. We're going to take a short break. I'm Peter Weitz. You're listening to the In Black and White's radio program on the Voice America Business Network. Voice America Business Network, the bottom line in business. Climbing Mount Everest is an amazing feat, and many have died trying to do so. However, more people have died descending Mount Everest than in reaching the summit. Part of the problem may be that people are so focused on reaching their objective that they fail to plan appropriately for what they will do or should be prepared for afterward. Similarly, people are so focused on saving for retirement and reaching retirement that they fail to plan appropriately for what they will encounter once they have actually retired. With one out of every four 65-year-olds today living past the age of 90, you may be retired longer than you are actually working. Have you devised a plan, process, and discipline to ensure that you will not run out of money? If you are not sure what to do, then simply contact Peter Weitz and his retirement team at Fusion Analytics. We help manage human emotions using three proprietary investment techniques. Our job is to evaluate the forces that the typical investor can't see so that wealth is preserved and not lost. Find out more at inblackandwhites.com. Whites is spelled W-E-I-T-Z. Email Peter at inblackandwhites.com. In Black and Whites, we win by not losing. Stephen Douglas Associates, delivering talent, impacting results. Now celebrating 30 years of bringing top talent to some of the nation's most recognizable companies and private equity firms, whether they need highly qualified executives permanently or on a project basis. Recognized by Inc. Magazine as one of the fastest growing companies in America in 2012 and 2013. To learn more, visit us at www.stephendouglas.com. The business community's first choice in Internet Talk Radio, Voice America Business Network. You are listening to In Black and Whites. To reach Peter Whites or his guest today, please call 1-866-472-5790. That's 1-866-472-5790. You may also send an email to peter at inblackandwhites.com. Whites is spelled W-E-I-T-Z. Email peter at inblackandwhites.com. Now, back to this week's program. Thank you very much, and welcome back to the show. You're listening to the In Black and Whites radio program. I am your host, Peter Whites. We are joined by Chip Starnes, the American hostage held in captivity in China. And uh, we ended the last segment with Chip talking about when he first got held hostage and what it was like. And his quick comment to me during the break was, make sure you listen in. It's about to get really good. So, Chip, why don't you pick up where you left off? When you were surrounded by several hundred of your workers, you were by yourself. All you had was your cell phone and no one else on your side. Yes, my my my, my two most uh, you know uh, closest items to me if you were at the time was my cell phone and actually my office. But you know, luckily they hadn't uh, ransacked or gone in there just yet. So um, it became you know. It, at this point, you know, through through Friday and into the night, everything's surreal. You know, I don't know how else to say it other than that, because you keep saying to yourself, "Is this really happened?" So, first, with the with the with all the employees jumping out of the trucks and coming in, you've got 150 people in there. Within uh, this is at 4:30, 4:45. By 5:36, 6:30, okay. Not only was it the employees, but then you have the employees' families. Yeah, the employees' brothers and sisters. The neighbors have come. Okay, so this had this had blown into 400, 500, 600 people that are all outside in the facility, standing outside, and now they had proactively locked down all of the entry points. And then, you know, I'm still on the phone with, with the U.S. Embassy going, okay, this is, com- this is completely out of, out of control. And, he's, and it's the typical mob type of scene where as time goes on, if, if, there's, no, if there's no water or anything to, to be thrown on this fuel, it's uh, we're continuing to slowly put, or at, at, or excuse me, on the fire. We're continuing to put uh, fuel uh, on it, and it's, it's starting to spiral out of control. Um, luckily, the U.S. Embassy, the one thing they did do, they said, you know, and the, 
was they, they contacted the local government. Local government officials came out. And then they came in and they, they, they basically were, became the res- referee between me and, and all the employees. And so we went into literally about an 18-hour drag-down session starting at about 8 o'clock Friday night all the way through until about 6, 7, 8 o'clock in the morning. And it was – when they came in, you know, keep in mind we're running a professional um, establishment here, a medical manufacturing facility. They came in, and there was complete chaos and uh, out of control. Our systems were completely uh, 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 on. They're playing games on them. They had gone into everything. There was uh, no no respect. or any, There was smoke in entire facilities, cigarette butts out. I mean, it was just completely out of control. And I spent the next 18 hours arguing with the government and them going, listen, just do the right thing that – you know, they they don't have the confidence that you're going to be here much longer. They want to get their severances. And I'm like, well, I don't know what else I can do other than tell them that we're having a job and we're only moving the one segment of the business, which is not a secret that we had already shared and told them that we were going to only the only part that we were going to move. And I told them if I was to pay everybody out severances, you know, we would be committing business suicide by doing so because I know for a sure fact if all these people were paid out and got those lump sums of money, no one would come back the next day. And that's what I sent arguing, trying to get the local government officials just to get everybody to go home, take a deep breath, come back the next day, and let's try to sort this out reasonably, which never, never happened. Actually, the number two government official that was there, the number one didn't come. There was about 15 government officials there, believe it or not, were in the facility. And about 6 a.m., 6.30, he goes, listen, you need, you need to make a decision. Okay, right now on what you want to do. Okay, so this is Saturday morning now. He goes, either you make a decision to pay all these people or all of us. He goes, we're tired. We want to go home. We're going to all stand up, and we're going to walk out of here. Okay, now keep in mind that they have brought in local government workers that had gone and ransacked our whole entire, all of our systems, all of our payrolls and everything. They had started, they took over all of our offices started drawing up and document drawing up contracts, okay, and put them in front of me to sign as contracts to pay them severances. And so I was so intimidated and no support at this particular point in time and my my GM or anybody was supporting me. I started to sign, I went back to my office and started to sign about twenty five percent of these documents. Now you and got that, these documents when you got these documents. Yeah. So you're now going on basically no sleep for twenty four hours? Correct. Yeah, that, that's that's exactly and right. And so, and was that when that was a tactic? Was to just keep you awake, intimidate you, force you to, to sign something because you just can't think straight? Yeah, I mean, it, it definitely. If it wasn't at that particular moment to be attacked, atta- you know, the, the government was just trying to do, to do everything they can to make the people happy. And I started to do that. I started to sign them, and ultimately, I said, you know what? I'm not going to sign them. You know, maybe, I don't know if they're going to kill me. I don't know what's going to happen, or if they're really going to walk out of here and they're going to leave me in here to fend for myself. But when I stopped doing that, that's exactly what happened. At 8 a.m., they all got up, they all left, and they left me in there with about 250 or 300 workers into, inside the facility that the next two days were absolutely torturous. That, that, and that's when the, all the things started happening. So I didn't sign them. 20% have gotten documents, and they use those to kind of uh, tease the other workers that they had gotten theirs. The other 80% didn't, and that's where things really got bad because – at that point in time, they, they locked off all the entry points, and you, know, you can see some of the clumps of people in one of the pictures I shared with you there. And also in one of the photos that I gave you, Peter, you can see the office with the big glass window. So what happened was they, everybody would, there would be 50 or 60 people in that office at one time. They were stand, standing literally like six, six inches around me for 24 hours a day, shining bright lights on me, wouldn't let you sleep, all um, mind games, intimidation type of tactics to try to break me down to get me to sign the documents that they wanted. And the local government, police, everybody, not one person came inside the facility to separate. They allowed all that to play out on its on its own. And we could go on, Chip, and probably talk about what happened over the next week for hours and hours and hours on end. Uh, unfortunately, uh, my Voice America program is only an hour long. I've got a couple minutes to wrap up the show. Uh, but ultimately, uh, through a relationship from your brother, you were able to get some traction with United Press International and some of the big news outlets over in Beijing. The story went viral, and as a result, negotiations were able to take place. 
to be able to get you out of captivity in China. That's exactly right. Yeah, my brother John Starnes. Yeah, he uh, um, has a girlfriend and uh, had a contact in Shanghai, and I actually hit the business wire over there. And they picked up the story, and I remember the first journalist that came to the window, they go, are you really being held hostage? And I said, yeah, I am. And uh, that's actually the one thing that actually opened all this up and gave me the ability to um, put things on a level playing field, not say level playing field, to where there became um, some humane, it became more of a humane type of situation uh, about the third day in where they were actually giving me food at this point. You know, the government was bringing water because everything was being documented, and obviously the, it had reached big government. So. Uh, once I started going, now it still didn't keep me from the fact that I still had to pay the ransom money to get out. All they said was this is a domestic dispute that they have to work out internally, and there's nothing they could do you know, from a police or security standpoint. That they absolutely uh, okay to hold me hostage and keep me there until they get what they want. And actually, I know one, one reporter asked one of the very large government officials in downtown Beijing if, uh, if Chip Starnes was actually being held hostage, and I know that he actually laughed. And said that no, he's free to go anywhere inside of, anywhere in China he wants to go. <laughs> That's interesting, Chip. I got to I appreciate you being on my program. I love the story. I know our listeners uh, find the story fascinating. There's some great photos of you being uh, held inside the factory on my blog at In Black and Whites. I'd like to invite you back in a couple months to come on the show uh, to talk about what's happened now that you're manufacturing in India. Um, and I think that that would be a great sort of segue into showing what happens when you leave China and go back to India. And I'm hoping that you'd consider that. Absolutely. I, w I would love the opportunity and um, look forward to it. Great. With that, I want to appreciate, Chip, you being on the program for uh, today. I think it was a fascinating show. I know every time I talk to you, I learn more about what happened to you when you were held hostage in China. And again, I can't thank you enough. And I'm glad you're back in the United States. We're glad you're back safe. We're glad you're back in business. Um, and I look forward to having you on the show soon. Thanks again. Thank you to all the listeners. If you want to follow up with an email to Peter at In Black and Whites for Chip, he'll be happy to respond to any of your emails. Uh, you can call uh, the hotline as well. And you can get into us at 866-472-5790. Thanks for the, being on the, listening to the program. I'm Peter Whites. This is the In Black and Whites radio show. Thank you again for tuning in to In Black and Whites. Please join your host, Peter Whites, again next Tuesday at 10 a.m. Eastern Time and 7 a.m. Pacific Time for another edition of the program on the Voice America Business Channel. Have a safe week. <laughs>